Hello, uh, my name is Olof Edsinger and I'm glad to be with you during this year's Apologetics Conference. Uh, as we all know, my presence this time is not physical but digital, uh, but I'm confident that we can make it anyway. Uh, as I'm a new acquaintance for many of you, uh, I want to start with a short presentation of myself. Uh, as you probably already know, I am the General Secretary of the Swedish Evangelical Alliance uh, and consequently I live in Sweden uh, and my work with the EA it means that I'm an active partaker in public debate uh, both within the church and in secular media uh, and that I also devote a lot of time for teaching and preaching. Uh, I'm also a very active author and writer having written about 15 books uh, mostly about the Bible and Christian discipleship. Uh, some of them are actually translated also into Finnish uh, published by Perisonoma Oy. Uh, and um, apart from books, I, I actually write ed editorials, especially for the Christian newspaper Verden idag, and that happens about twice a month. Uh, today, however, uh, the topic is the book of Jeremiah, uh, and this is actually the longest book of scriptures. Uh, we could easily spend a whole weekend just digging into Jeremiah's message. Uh, but today we will look at the book from the perspective of the situation here also in Nordic Christianity. Uh, and I will try to mirror part of the message also in the book of Revelations, uh, a book that um, will also be the focus of the third Bible study during this conference, as you may know. Uh, but more of that later. Uh, before we do anything else, I think we should pray together. Lord, thank you for this conference and thank you for this opportunity to dig into your holy word. Uh, we pray for this Bible hour and we ask your own Holy Spirit to guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there are more and more signs telling us that the Church of Europe is ill. Uh, even though we live in a time where global Christianity is growing, uh, there are few places in Europe uh, that can speak of a significant revival. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions, uh, and the situation is not pitch black, uh, but Western Christianity has clearly passed the best before date, uh, at least at le as it looks right now. A spiritual crisis in the Church of God, though, it's nothing new. Uh, it has happened numerous times throughout the history of the church and also in ancient Israel. Uh, and one of the deepest of these crises we can read about uh, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, he depicts a period in Judah, uh, the southern kingdom of Israel, uh, that is marked by great upheavals. Uh, Jeremiah himself, he is called the uh, into prophetic ministry in the 13th year of King Josiah. Josiah, he had actually become king uh, already at the age of eight. Uh, but a few years after the time that Jeremiah became prophet, he embarked on a major and comprehensive reformation of his kingdom's spiritual life. King Josiah did so. And the background to this is, is a long period of both spiritual and moral uh, decay. Not least during the reign of King Manasseh, who ruled for 55 long years in Jerusalem. And in both Second Kings and Second Chronicles, we can read about the legacy of Manasseh. And in Second Kings 21 verse 16 it says that Manasseh shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. That's really a sad legacy. And in many ways we can say that this was the last straw in God's eyes. Uh, Judea was ready for God's judgment. Uh, but under Josiah's leadership, there is still a kind of respite, and it's likely that also Jeremiah was involved in the king's reforms. Uh, on the other hand, when Josiah dies during a war against Pharaoh Necho II, uh, who passed Israel when he was to fight actually against Assyria, uh, it is as if the nation loses it again. And sadly, the process is both swift and dramatic. 
Uh, Jeremiah calls the people to repentance, but instead he has to witness his countrymen harden and eventually also be deported to Babylon. Uh, Jeremiah himself, he remains in Jerusalem, but quite soon and against his own will, he has to follow his countrymen to Egypt, uh, as the remaining Jews believe that they will get help from Pharaoh. Uh, there is much to say about this and about Jeremiah's personal fate. Uh, it is not without reason that uh, he is called the weeping prophet. Uh, in any case, it's clear that very few of the Lord's servants have had such an ungrateful mission to accomplish as Jeremiah had. Time and time again we can read about the prophet's complaints about his own fate. One of the strongest examples of this is found in the 20th chapter of the book, where Jeremiah pours out his heart like this, You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Already here I think we have a good reason to stop. Uh, it would certainly be wrong to say that today's situation in Sweden and Finland could be as serious as it was in Judah during the 6th century BC. But as we will see, there are many striking parallels between then and now. Uh, and regardless of the degree of seriousness, uh, there is no doubt that the situation also in the Nordic countries is problematic. I would say deeply problematic. And already with this analysis one can say that we end up in a similar place as Jeremiah. And for that matter also most of the other prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, we are given the impopular assignment of diagnosing a sick patient. Uh, to tell others and ourselves how it is uh, and to identify what we see that is contrary to God's will. And the more secularized we become, the less grateful the mission is going to be. Uh, the more the Nordic peoples distance themselves from the Lord, the less applause we will receive for pointing out that which is the spiritual illness of our people. Therefore, we should also read on and draw comfort from the continuation of what the prophet prays in Jeremiah 20. He says that the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, le let me see you and your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord, he rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. That is where Jeremiah has his hope, in God and is in his power. Uh, but what was the problem with the people of Judah, really? What, what was their problem and what are the parallels between them and our situation today? Well, if you start on a more general level, it can be said that we are dealing with a nation that seems to take God's favor for granted. Uh, they were God's chosen people. They were entrusted with his law. And they were the location of God's holy temple. And this is something that we can relate to also in Sweden and Finland. Throughout history, the Nordic countries have boasted about being Christian nations. We had the cross in our flags. We have thousands of churches and chapels. And in addition to this, we stand out in the world as a whole, uh, with many countries around the globe, uh, especially a few decades ago, uh, casting jealous glances on our tax-financed welfare systems. There is a national pride in our Nordic countries that can in many ways be perceived as justified, but that can also turn into the kind of pride 
that manifested itself in Laodicea in the New Testament. You know, the church in Jesus' last letters in, in Revelation 3, about which the Lord says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. Something similar can actually be said about the case of Judah. You have my law, one might perceive the Lord saying, but what does it matter when you do not live by it? Have you forgotten that with knowledge there also comes responsibility, and from the one who has been given much, much will be demanded? Those are Jesus' words, but they could also have been said to Judah. In the 31st chapter of Jeremiah we can read the famous words about the new covenant, covenant, and they have to do with this. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will not be like, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after this time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor and say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. As Christians, we live in the fulfillment of this promise. And that means, of course, that we too have a responsibility. Uh, it's true that Scripture says that the Holy Spirit has been given the task of transforming the hardness of our hearts so that we can do uh, what is God's will for our lives and from our free will. But we also need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in this. And Jesus' brother Jacob, he puts it like this, Don't merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. And a little later, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and continues in it, not forgetting that they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So we have been entrusted with the gift of the Holy Spirit and the call to live according to God's will. But with that also comes a responsibility not just to cherish the new covenant, but also to honor it in our own lives. Um, and in a similar way we'll, with all the other outward signs of our faith, like the cross in the flag, the church buildings and the chapels, uh, they need, mean, have to also mean something in practice, not just as our great and long tradition. I live in Uppsala, and we have actually the largest cathedral in the whole of the northern Europe. It's almost 120 meters high and 120 meters long from the 13th century. It's an impressive building to, I think, everyone who visits this church. And having that kind of building can, can make you tempted to think the same way as, as they did in Judah. It is we who have it. God must still show us his favor because of our buildings and our great history. But in this matter the voice of the Lord is actually crystal clear. Uh, in Jeremiah 7, verses 3 to 8, the prophet says like this, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. 
do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place. In the land I gave you your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. And then Jeremiah goes on and, and explains the situation further. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did in Shiloh, I will now do in the house that bears my name. The temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your ancestors, I will trust you from my, thrust you from my presence, just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. We will soon return to the specific sins that the Lord mentions here. Uh, but here and now it may be enough to note that uh, God's favor is nothing that we can take for granted. That is the general message of, of these verses. God's favor is nothing that we can take for granted. And just because a place or a building has been marked by God's blessing, there is no saying this will always be the case. So once again we see a parallel to Jesus' words in the book of Revelation where he speaks of the church in Ephesus. Consider how far you have fallen, he says. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Even in our day, God can choose to remove the lampstand from his congregation. God does not give his glory to idols and even in the kingdom of God there are red lines that it has serious consequences to violate. Uh, in the case of the southern kingdom the situation grew so dramatic that they in practice made the Lord himself their enemy. So when the people are defeated by the Babylonians and therefore also deported to what would become a 70 year long exile. Jeremiah says that this is actually the work of God himself. A shocking statement. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them inside this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm, in furious anger and in great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both man and beast, and they will die for a terrible plague. I myself will fight against you, says the Lord. And I don't think anything could be more terrible than to have the Lord himself as your enemy. But this is how low Judah had sunk and their own covenant with God was forced, uh, th their own covenant God was forced to turn against them and hand them over to their enemies. Let's pray that you and I never end up in a situation where we sink this deep without repenting and asking God for forgiveness. Because these are serious words from the Holy Scriptures. And if nothing else, this can illustrate that the church's apostasy is a serious thing. When we take God's favor for granted and with this as an excuse, choose to challenge his mercy, 
well, then there are a number of red lines that we are about to cross. The last and the most terrible of these red lines is the one concerning our own salvation. As the book of Hebrews puts it, uh, and these are powerful words, uh, provocative words. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who re rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. That is what the Lord tells us in the New Testament. And these are really serious words. But what then was the more specific problem in the kingdom of Judah? And what are the parallels between their time and ours? Well, in the second part of this Bible study, I want to walk through Jeremiah 2 together with you. Uh, that's where the prophet Jeremiah paints a very vivid picture of the problems of his time. Uh, as I do this, I also want to point out the parallels to another important section of scriptures in the New Testament. And I have already referred to it on several occasions. Uh, that is the seven letters of the book of Revelation. Because in Jesus' letters to the churches uh, in Asia Minor, uh, he makes a, a diagnosis that has to do, as I see it at least, with the church of all ages. And as we will see, uh, the parallels between these letters and the book of Jeremiah are quite large. We can see this already in the first two verses. Uh, of Jeremiah 2. The word of the Lord came to me, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Here God speaks of Israel's time as a bride, when she allowed herself to be led by God's pillar of cloud, uh, and also a pillar of fire in the wilderness, and how she loyally adhered to her Lord's commandments. And I presume it's not only me who hears the parallel here to Jesus' message to the church in Ephesus. I hold this against you, says the Lord. You have forsaken the love you first had. After all, this is where everything in our Christian lives should begin, in our love for Jesus and his words. And Revelation 2 echoes Jeremiah 2 in that sense. Uh, it's not that we always have to be obedient. Uh, of course we should, <laughs> uh, but, but that is not possible for sinful man. Um, if we always had to be obedient, no one man would be qualified uh, at all in the presence of God. But what God is really looking for, I think, is the undivided heart, our personal dedication, our desire to have Jesus not only as a means to our personal agendas, but as our true Lord and Savior, as our highest authority in all areas of life. According to Jesus, this is exactly what is the focus of the uh, greatest and first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the starting point. And of course it's also the goal. But it starts with the heart. And if we get lost here, it's only a matter of time before we get lost also in all other areas of our lives. 
The next area that God addresses through the prophet Jeremiah, it has to do with secularization, but also with idolatry. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, uh, through a land of desert and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. They did not ask for their covenant God. And this too is in many ways an echo of our own time. Ever since the Enlightenment, one can say that the church has been a constant whipping boy in Europe. It's only superstition to believe in a God who can do signs and miracles, people have said. Western civilization did not grow because of uh, Christian influence, but rather in spite of Christian influence. What has Christianity ever done for women, for slaves, for homosexuals? Christianity has become the whipping boy of European intellectuals and also many others. And this has to do, of course, also with secularization, because secularization has uh, often been described as a collective oblivion. We no longer remember or do not want to remember the significance of the Christian faith for today's society. And when we don't give any recognition to the church and Christian faith, it's not a very big step to reject that which was previously held as truth. And then you start emphasizing other things instead. Worship other gods. New ideologies are allowed to replace previous beliefs, much like socialism did in the 1970s, the Red 70s, and the LGBTQ movement has done now in the 2000s. Not to mention the general humanism that puts man and his abilities rather than God and his power at the center of life. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols, says the Lord in Isaiah 42. But time and time again, sinful man wants to force him to do just that. To let others have the praise that only he is worthy of. And this is secularization and idolatry. In the seven letters of Revelation, this becomes clearest in Jesus' words to Pergamum and Theatira. Uh, in Pergamum, there are people who cling to the teaching of Balaam. And in Theatira, there is a false prophetess that leads the church of God to be unfaithful and eat the flesh of idolatry. So in both these cases, the problem is an unwillingness to be reconciled with the idea of the Lord as the supreme authority to worship only one God. And as so often, the main rivals turn out to be money, sex, and power. And what the scriptures have to say about these things is that they can certainly be good and able servants. Uh, money, sex, and power are excellent servants, but they are also lousy masters. As Jeremiah puts it in chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet there are no gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Unfortunately, this is a telling picture also of the situation in our Nordic countries. For although our faith in God and all the good things that came from this lay the foundation for our present prosperity, there are nowadays completely different gods and ideology that receive the glory for this. But neither the wells of socialism, nor humanism, nor the LGBTQ movements will in the long run be able to quench that which is our deepest thirst.
thirst as humans. This is the great hangover of idolatry. And in our time we see it, among other things, in the psychological unhealth of our young generation. A generation that drinks the water from cisterns, wells that do not hold water. And what hinders this spiritual dehydration is materialism, uh, as this is the common thread in many of the other isms that have overtaken today's Europe. Socialism is a human construction without God, a secular doctrine of salvation. Therefore, it dehydrates us when we uh, let it overtake our mind. Humanism obviously is a human construction, also without God, where man and man alone is the me measure of everything. Even the LGBTQ movement is in many cases a human construction without God, as it denies God's created order for our sexual lives. And so we too can recognize ourselves in the words of Jeremiah, uh, verse 26 to 28 in chapter 2. As a thief is disgraced when he is caught, so the people of Israel are disgraced. They, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets. They say to wood, you are my father, or to stone, you gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me and not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, come and save us. Where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble. For you, Judah, have as many gods as you have towns. Even a person who rejects God must direct his or her worship in some direction. Someone or something must be pointed out as the source of life. In Judah, people said to the carved idols that you are my father, or to a stone that you gave me birth. In our time and culture, it is materialistic ideologies, such as those that I have already mentioned, uh, or for that matter, blind evolution, that tends to get credit for the existence of our lives and our world. And this too, of course, is a form of idolatry. There are many parallels between Jeremiah's time and ours. But despite this, repentance, repentance is completely absent, uh, at least in Jeremiah's time. In spite of all this, you say, I am innocent. He is not angry with me. But I will pass judgment on you because you say, I have not sinned. Jeremiah 2 and 35. And this too is a characteristic of sinful man throughout the ages. And the same is therefore said also about the situation in Theatira in Revelation. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. That's what Jesus says about the prophetess Jezebel. She is unwilling to repent. And this, of course, is the most serious problem of them all. For a man who cannot repent also cannot be cured of his delusion, of his sin. As Jeremiah puts it in the sixth chapter, From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wounds of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when well, there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. And here you can actually say that the circle is closed. As long as we downplay our desperate situation, as long as we maintain that everything is fine, as long as that, our problems will last. But if we want to use the word of the Lord as a confessional, 
then there is hope both for our souls and for our churches. Then both the book of Jeremiah and Jesus' words in the book of Revelation can become a launching pad for something greater. Then the end can also be something brighter and more positive than what became the outcome for Judah. It's certainly true that many precious promises had been given to the Israelites and that God through history had proven faithful to everything that he had said. But it is only through faith that we can partake in the Lord's promises. In our case, the faith in Jesus, which in turn is manifested in repentance and in our love for the risen Christ. Therefore, let us pray for this conference that we will enter it and enter this weekend together with an attitude of faith and that the Lord himself will meet us in that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your holy scriptures and, and what it has to tell us both about what happened then, but not least about what is going on right now. And as I said, I pray that you help us to use the words of Jeremiah as a confessional and also the words of Jesus in Revelation 2 and 3. Texts that mirror so much of what is going on also in the Nordic countries right now. Lord, help us to listen to your word and to take the consequences of the diagnosis that you have given us about our illness, our disease. Lord, we realize that there are many things we should mourn in today's Sweden and Finland. There are things going on that is really taking things in the wrong direction. An unfaithfulness to your word and your covenant. Lord, help us to, to not put our confidence in what once was our glorious past or our beautiful buildings. Lord, we, we only want to put our trust in you, in who you are, in your holy presence. For this conference, Lord, we pray that you teach us about what is really on your heart for today and also how we can tackle the attacks on your word and your church, both from outside forces and from within. Lord, already now I want to confess the sin of your church, that we are actually guilty of so much in this development. We don't have the mandate to just point our fingers at others, but you and your word points the finger at our hearts. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to underscore that finger. Help us to see the seriousness in what is going on. And Lord, as we enter this conference, we want to do it with humble hearts truly asking you for your forgiveness for our part in what is going on. And then as in the situation of Laodicea, we ask that you give us the salve that our eyes are in need of, to see things the way you see, to see through the facades, the make-believes. 
and actually pr practice true spiritual discernment. Lord, humble us, teach us, equip us, and as you did with Jeremiah, encourage us. For where we have you, we have everything that we need. All praise to you, King Jesus, forever and ever. That is also something we want to pray. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen.